like to introduce Logan, Logan Kasarik. 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 Yeah. Thank you from Auctioner. That's right. Auctioner. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. Great yeah. All right. Uh, so yeah, the topic is RV function. Uh, kind of an outline of what we'll go through. Uh, we'll talk about why the RV can be a tricky thing to assess, and then we'll go through some of the variables we use to assess the RV, uh, including both the hemodynamic and echo variables, and then finally a couple slides on treating RV failure. But first, before we get into that, I'm kind of obliged to preach to you, the choir, just briefly on the fact that the RV is important, and certainly you shouldn't need any convincing of that because you're here, but there's a wealth of evidence within the literature that basically comes to the same conclusion, which is that when the RV does poorly, so does the patient. Uh, so it behooves us to know how to assess it and how to treat it, but that can be a tricky thing to do, and I think the main way that the RV can be tricky to assess is it's got a weird shape. Sometimes it looks like a triangle, sometimes it looks like a crescent. The whole thing altogether has been described as a tea kettle, but it's about the weirdest looking tea kettle. But you can get an appreciation for how different 2D cuts of the RV uh, look different depending on the cut when you look at different TE views. So in a metasophageal four chamber, it kind of looks like a triangle there all the way on the left. In a uh, RV inflow outflow in the middle, it's kind of a lopsided U-shape wrapping around the aortic valve. And then in a transgastric short axis on the right, it looks kind of like a crescent. Uh, a couple other things you can pick up from TE views is that the RV is relatively far away from the probe, so that makes it a little tougher to image. It also has a bit of an unusual contraction pattern. So the free wall of the RV you can appreciate on the image on the right, the transgastric view, kind of squeezes up against the interventricular septum. Uh, you can also notice from the middle image in the RV inflow outflow that tricuspid annulus is kind of swinging up and down in addition to the free wall squeezing up against the interventricular septum. The last thing I'll note about why the RV can be tricky to assess is that it's exquisitely sensitive to loading conditions, particularly after load. So the RV tends to be more of a volume pump. It can handle relatively large swings in volume, but is uh, any increase in PVR or after load uh, causes a significant drop off in the stroke volume. And that would be opposite to the LV, which can handle all, all sorts of pressure, but not quite as much volume as the RV. All right, so what are the ways we go about assessing the RV? Uh, I have these broken down into the hemodynamic and echo variables. Uh, these are the ones I chose to go through. Certainly there are many, many more, especially with echo. Uh, but I did want to use this slide to just briefly make a pitch or talk about your qualitative assessment. That is, your sort of expert opinion, subjective eyeball test of the RV, which is something that will develop over the next year and for the rest of your career, really. Uh, and certainly the value of that can't be overstated and will depend on what your experience is. So it takes a lot of reps looking at hundreds of echoes, obviously. But there is one sort of sneaky advantage that we have in cardiac anesthesia and surgery, and it shouldn't be uh, forgotten. It's that we can just look over the drape. Turns out when you crack the chest open, that thing bouncing around, and there's the RV. So when you're looking at the echo, whether it looks normal or abnormal, it's worthwhile just to get in the habit of peeking over the drape and comparing what real life, real life looks like to the echo, and that will help you develop that sort of eyeball test. So going through some of the hemodynamic uh, variables we use to assess the RV, the first one is good old standby CVP. Certainly CVP comes with a host of caveats like whether there's TR, whether there's you know, increased intrathoracic pressure, the patient positioning, dysrhythmias. But considering all that, if you take it all into account, CVP can still be uh, extremely useful when you're uh, using it as part of your assessment for the RV. So much so that Intermax, um, Intermax is a, a registry of uh, clinical outcomes for patients who have LVADs and mechanical assist devices. They uh, have come out with what is probably the best, most recent uh, definition for periop RV failure. And you can see there they use CVP as one of the big staples of its definition. So if the CVP is high, they use 18, and the index is low, and there's no other reason to explain it, and the patient is requiring ext extensive therapy, then that's periop RV failure. PA pressures, uh, turns out, aren't 
that great in and of themselves as a way to assess the RV, uh, just in isolation. It'd be like using your systemic pressures to evaluate the LV function. Not, not the best way to go about it. Certainly PA pressures have their, have their use in, in diagnosing other acute situations like acute MR or, or protamine reaction. But when you have a PA catheter in place, the other two things you get from it are usually more useful when assessing function, both, both the right and the left ventricle certainly, but the index and the SVO2 usually come in handy uh, more often for that. These next two things I'm going to talk about aren't, aren't as popular or aren't utilized as much, but I think they're kind of interesting and there's a compelling case to use both of them. Uh, the reason I like them is because they're pretty simple and they can be added on to what you're probably already doing. So the first one is to continuously monitor the RV pressure waveform. So basically you take a transducer and you hook it up to your RV port or infusion port of the PA and you overlay that tracing on your PA and you get something like this where the dark, and this would be what a normal tracing would look like where the dark line is the RV and the lighter line is the PA tracing. Uh, and you can see the, during diastole the RV pressure is basically flat with maybe a slight incline, which makes sense. Uh, and the reason you might be inclined to do this is it turns out it's a very uh, dynamic, instantaneous assessment of the RV, how it's doing. And so the top uh, image there, it would be a normal tracing where, again, the diastolic pressure is kind of flat. And as RV function starts to develop, dysfunction starts to happen or develop, the diastolic pressure starts to rise and you get this equilibration in the RV diastolic pressure and, and the PA diastolic pressure. And as that continues to progress, you start to get what's called a square root sign, where basically immediately at the start of diastole, the RV diastolic pressure equilibrates with the PA pressure. And it looks like a square root sign. Uh, you might also be able to pick up with uh, continuous RV tracing that the upslope on during systole would be delayed, kind of a, the equivalent of the pulsus tardis you might see with the LV. You can also get that with an RV tracing. It would also be, I don't have an image of it, but it would also be in the, in the rare instance you have RVOT obstruction, you'd be able to easily pick it up because the RV pressure would be very high and the PA systolic pressure would be low. Uh, this is a cool kind of clinical case scenario where it became very useful. So all the way on the left would be pre-bypass. You'd see a normal relationship between RV and PA pressures. And then after bypass, there's the beginning of a square root sign where the P, uh, the RV diastolic pressure was equilibrating with the PA pressure. And then they gave some milrinone and things got immediately better. Another thing to point out here is that between when things were going well pre-bypass and when things were going poorly after bypass, the PA pressures were essentially the same. In fact, the PA pressures were slightly lower when things were going uh, poor. So that's kind of a good uh, thing to remember is that certainly high PA pressures are bad. Nobody wants that. The RV is not going to tolerate that forever. Um, but low or normal PA pressures doesn't necessarily mean things are going well. It could be that the RV is so severely dysfunctional it just can't generate pressures that high anymore. And the last uh, hemodynamic variable I'll talk about here, uh, that equation got a little messed up, but it's pretty simple. Uh, it's the PAPI or pulmonary artery pressure index and it's simply the PA uh, pulse pressure, PA systolic minus diastolic divided by the CVP. And this equation was first described as a way to assess RV function specifically, I think in 2012. And it's since been studied several times, particularly in the LVAD population. So patients who ha were coming in for LVADs. Uh, they looked at a host of different hemodynamic variables listed here. And what they found was using a cutoff of a PAP index of less than 1.85 was most sensitive and specific among all the variables for uh, predicting those patients who would have RV failure. And so if you have a PA catheter in place, it's a super simple thing to calculate and turns out to be incredibly accurate. And to sort of drive that point home, this was a study that was just published this year in April and it looked at both hemodynamic and echo variables. And look, and again, it was an LVAD patients, and it sought to determine which ones were most associated with RV failure. And they looked at those variables pre-op and after the chest was closed. So among all the pre-op variables they looked at, both echo and hemodynamic, um, they found that CVP and PAP index were the only ones that achieved statistical significance for being able to, or, or being associated with RV failure. 
and you can see the cutoff there around 18 with the CVP. And again, with the data after the chest was closed, looking at the same variable, some of the echo variables achieved statistical significance, but the CVP and PAPI were again the most uh, closely associated with RV function, had the lowest p-value. Uh, one of the caveats to this study is that they used the Intermax definition for RV failure, so CVP was part of what they used to define RV failure, so if you're using it to define it, it'll probably be associated with it. Um, so we don't have to throw away the TE probe just yet. So getting in some of the, the ways we assess the RV with TE, I wanted to go over just some quick and simple ways that we use to assess it with TE that don't involve any calculation or even measurements really. And these are so simple, I think my two-year-old could probably swing it. Um, so the first one is that the RV should be smaller than the LV. It should be about 60% of the size of the LV. So if it's the same size or bigger, it's got significant dilation and probably dysfunction. And you can see here this patient has uh, RV failure from MR. It, you can also pick up the second point here is that the RV is starting to make part of the apex of the heart. The RV should only come down to about two-thirds the way of the interventricular septum. And so if it goes all the way down, makes it part of the apex, again, you probably have some RV dilation, or you definitely have RV dilation with this function. Um, here's... Another good example that shows both of those, but it's also a great example of the third point, which I really like and use all the time, which is that the atrial septum tends to bow over towards the left. That one's super simple to pick up, very just objective and quick, and it often will occur before you see free wall motion abnormalities on the RV. So you'll start to see some TR and some uh, atrial bowing towards the left. So the atrium, sh the atrial uh, septum should usually bow over the other way, the left atrial pressure is usually higher than the right atrial pressure. So if you have an acute change, like the common thing that happens when you're coming off pump and a little bit of air goes down the right coronary, uh, this is an easy way to quickly pick up on that. This is the patient who has acute RCA ischemia, and you can see some free wall dysfunction occurring there, but I'll tell you that the atrial septum bowing and some TR were the first things to show up in this case. Uh, this is a really egregious example of all of these things put together. This patient has primary pulmonary hypertension, uh, severely dilated RV, making up basically all the apex, atrial septum bowing over, got some severe RVH as well. Couldn't help but include this one because it's so much fun. Dilated RV, making up the apex, that atrial septum really bowing over. This is a patient who had a massive pulmonary embolus and not all the embolus made it through. Uh, so it's about the size of a ping pong ball of blood clot in there. Um, here's the last example of something quick and simple you can use to assess the RV, and this is in a transgastric short axis view. You can appreciate this is a picture of the LV mainly, but when there is pressure or volume overload of the RV, you'll start to see that the LV takes the shape of the letter D, kind of a D-shaped left ventricle, and the conventional teaching is that when the LV is shaped more like a D in diastole, it's from volume overload, and it's when it's shaped more like a D in systole, it's from pressure overload. So this is kind of more of a D in diastole, I'd say. Um, so there you go. Those are the quick and simple ways we use to assess the RV in, in, with TEE. Uh, these are some of the, just a few of the many objective quantitative ways we can assess the RV. I chose these three because they're uh, relatively simple and, and conceptually different from one another. The first one is called fractional area change. And this is simply measuring the area in diastole and then measuring the area in systole and getting the percentage ch that it changes from one to the other. Uh, so this would be an example of a normal fraction area change. Uh, so we got it calculating the, the FAC here, we get a 53%, so abnormal would be less than 35. I like this example because it's the same patient I showed you earlier who had acute RCA ischemia. Basically, we came off pump after a cabbage AVR and things were looking great like they were here and then the RCA graph kinked, and we didn't find out until a little bit later. Uh, but this is after bypass when things were going well, and then moments later this happened, and the fractional area change went from 53 to 26. Um, the RV certainly, it's easy to pick out that it's dilated, and then I'll again make a pitch that the atrial septal wall is also bowing over. All right, the next objective way we can assess the RV is with TAPSI. TAPSI is tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. And this is quite simply just how much the annulus of the tricuspid moves, literally just the distance it moves in centimeters. Uh, 
there's kind of a cheat, easy way to do this in a metasophageal four chamber if you measure in diastole the distance from the annulus to the apex and then in systole from the annulus to the apex. That'll give you uh, an easy way to get a tapsy, but a uh, fancier way to do it that is more in line with how it's done with TTE, which is where most of the evidence for tapsy comes from, is to get to try to get good alignment with the ultrasound beam and the way that the um, the tricuspid annulus is moving. So I think that this is most often uh, can be done, though not always, is in a transgastric RV inflow view, which is uh, seen here. Uh, basically, the tricuspid annulus is moving parallel to the ultrasound beam, so you should be able to throw in mode down the annulus and you get this sort of wave hill looking pattern and that bump or hill or wave or whatever represents the tricuspid annulus as it moves over time. So you just freeze that image and measure the height of that wave and that'll give you the tapsy. Now again, you can't always get good alignment, so uh, you take what you can get, but essentially this would be a normal tapsy. Abnormal would be less than 1.6, this is 1.9. Last thing I'm gonna talk briefly about myocardial performance index as a way to assess the RV. Uh, the concept here is if you look at the time that the RV spends actually doing work and you see within that time how much of it is spent actually moving blood forward. So the more time it spends moving blood forward, the better. In contrast to that, let's say the RV is doing a lot of work and not moving any blood forward, uh, so, in, in other words, it spends a lot of time in isovolemic contraction and isovolemic relaxation. Well, that's bad. And the MPI is just a way to put a number on that. So, with echo, you're able to get the isovolemic, and iso, uh, the isovolemic times together, and if you divide that by the ejection time, that's your MPI. So, a higher number is bad, lower number is good, abnormal will be le uh, greater than 0.4. Essentially, the way you'd be able to get those numbers is explained in this diagram here. You can either get the entire time of a TR jet or the time from uh, the end of an A wave to the beginning of an E wave. And that includes both your ejection time and your isovolemic times. So if you subtract out your ejection time, that leaves you with just isovolemic times. And you divide that by your ejection time. So the more ejection is good, more isovolemic time is bad. And this one's neat because it's the only one of these variables that includes an assessment of both systolic function and diastolic function, because isovolemic relaxation is technically in, in diastole. All right, so just a couple more slides here on uh, treating RV dysfunction. Uh, certainly epi is gonna be part of your armamentarium. It's, epi sells itself. I don't need to tell you how great epi is. Uh, certainly at higher doses of epi, there's something to be said about increasing PVR and causing RV dysfunction, but uh, more often than not, this will be your go-to, especially when the systemic pressures are low. Uh, vasopressin, also a good friend of the RV because it has minimal to no effect on PVR. There are no vasopressin receptors there. This was a cool study that was published within the last couple years, and they basically took some radio arteries and some pulmonary arteries and doused them in a bunch of different drugs, and vaso was represented by the line with the diamonds on it. So you can see the radio artery at higher doses of vaso contracted more and the pulmonary arteries uh, did nothing with any vaso. So, or with, with all amounts of vaso, it did uh, no contraction. It's an in vitro study, uh, so caveats there, but still pretty compelling. Then you got your inodilators, milrinone being a favorite, and uh, certainly very reliable uh, inotropic drug. Problem is it also reliably decreases your systemic pressures because it causes vasodilation. So you can really only give it when your systemics can tolerate it. Uh, but there's a, a cool method of administration where you can either give it inhaled, and there's also some good recent uh, initial literature on just taking a syringe of it and bolusing it down the ET tube, which has less of effect on your systemic pressure. Still some, but not as much as giving it uh, IV. Uh, and then finally, we have the inhaled uh, vasodilators like nitric oxide and epoprosinol or Flolan. Each of those has their, um, has their advantages, disadvantages. Nitric oxide is, is more expensive, but it's more uh, potent. Uh, the downside, in addition to its expense, is that it comes in a bulky, uh, uh, the way you administer it is, is in this huge tank and bulky uh, system. Whereas Flolan uh, is not quite as potent, it's cheaper and it's easier to transport. I believe it also requires a sort of filter because of the, the mixture it comes in. We use nitric because we like to spend money. <laughs>
Um, and then lastly, if none of that works, you got a bunch of pumps you can uh, set up in the RV that, uh, that we don't have time to go through, but essentially you have a lot of options there. That's it. Thanks.